part of what we're trying to impart through this program is really the importance of leadership and the understanding of what corporate leadership is about. So I use the P for pilotage or, you know, pilots are, uh, are leaders and uh, that, that is a significant component in the program. And time and time again, we're going to hear the significance and the importance of leadership in creating excellence. Quality management places a premium on people, you know. It's kind of ironic. In a lot of corporations, I think people spend more time thinking about the equipment than the people, you know. And quality management seems to indicate that people are the most important resource. Now, what decisions could I ask myself were made in the post office about future generations? We are about survival. You know, it was the government on our backs. They wanted to privatize us in the mid-90s, and we had to actually increase profit to the detriment of our staff and probably to the detriment of our customers. They are unable to solve equations with more than four or five variables non-linear with mathematical tools. It's impossible. So we must solve the problem with the systems view. The middle management is uh, very critical in a successful implementation of the system. The major uh, difficulty overcome the, the resistance. The most effective way is to get them involved. Different places have different definitions of quality. And the reason the definition varies is dependent upon the current understanding of what is TQM. It's widely varying from place to place. Current status of business and quality management practices. And finally, differences in socioeconomic conditions or environment in a particular society. And tonight, I'm going to just to be able to funnel down through the visionary leadership coming up the stream from the government itself, what I'm going to show you right now, how the visionary made Dubai, and then going down to a specific example when we put all the principles of the quality management into action. And because of its move to, towards uh, a more of a business excellence approach in terms of the standard, then I think worldwide more organisations now understand what business excellence is and uh, can hopefully uh, improve uh, their competitiveness. We need to seek perfection. So the measure of success ultimately is going to be or a measure of quality or a measure of what I call per perfection. Um, it might be an elusive concept, but we need to have it in mind. We need to have stretch goals towards perfection. We need to have our distinctiveness, our distinction. That is the true differentiating factor between excellence and average. And the distinctiveness really is the mark of excellence. And the mark of excellence is about having quality as the penultimate measure. What I'm going to talk about is the impact of total quality management on corporate performance. Uh, you're talking about global leadership uh, excellence program. And what you're really looking at in this particular program is a lot of principles which we call, which we sort of group under total quality management. And total quality management has been around for a long time, you know, I mean, uh, in some sense, I think in the U.S. it was introduced in the early 80s when the Japanese were beating the American automobile manufacturer and we were losing market share. And that's the time when a lot of the industries started adopting this uh, quality management philosophy. Now the problem is that whenever you look at a new management paradigm and you introduce it particularly in the U.S., one of the first questions is, okay, if we do this, what kind of benefit we'll get, you know? And more often than not, the benefit is not in terms of, yeah, my customers will be happy or my people will be happy. Uh, management wants to see that if we adopt this particular paradigm, what impact will it have on the bottom line? Uh, the very bottom line driven, you want to increase the shareholder value, you want to make more money, and I'm sure that's true in most places, you know. So in U.S., sort of, a lot of companies adopted quality management in the 80s, and then the issue became, does this stuff really have an impact on the bottom line? And I started looking at this issue in the early 90s, and I was reading a lot of articles on business excellence, quality management, and very eloquent articles, very well written, and often when I would read that, it all made sense to me, you know. And at the end of each article, I would ask myself the question, well, what's been the impact of these things on the bottom line? And unfortunately, I couldn't get the answer, you know. So as part of my job at Georgia Tech, part of my job is doing research, you know. So I said, you know, let's look at this particular paradigm, quality management, and try to estimate that if you do it well or effectively, what kind of impact will it have on bottom line, you know. And actually, that should be very important because as rational people, if I give you evidence on what's the impact of a particular paradigm, 
you may decide to do it or not do it, you know, but without evidence, it's a very hard decision to make, you know, okay? And what I thought here was that around the time I was doing this research, there were a fair amount of people in the U.S. who were very skeptical about it, and I'll talk to you a little bit about that. So I said, you know, if I do this research, if I don't find anything, the skeptics will buy it, so that's kind of good news, and if I find something, the proponents will buy it, so in that sense, it was a no-risk project, you know, okay? And for some of you who are aware of the academic environment, uh, we have a policy or we have a saying which my dean tells every new faculty who joins it, and this is very simple, publish or perish, you know. So what you want to do is you want to pick projects where if you get these results, it'll still be publishable. If it's the other set of results, there'll be an audience for that. You know? So I thought, you know, studying this particular stuff would be quite interesting, and let's see what the real value of these principles or paradigms are, you know. So the way I've organized my talk is I'll give you a little bit of history about why I did this stuff and what are some people talking, uh, saying about quality management. Then I'll sort of pose a couple of questions which my study tries to address. I will talk a little bit about the methodology which I used to do this study and then share, then share with you some other results, you know. So one of the questions is, what is total quality management? And you'll find a lot of definitions, and in some sense, this is my own definition. It's fairly simple. It's a foundation for developing and operating a management system. Every company has a management system, and total quality management is a particular type of management system. And whenever you talk about management system, it's based on certain principles. And in the case of quality management, I believe that there are four major principles that we need to look at. The first one is uh, total customer satisfaction. And with some of you we're going to talk about today on customer loyalty and customer satisfaction, the fundamental premise is that our job is to satisfy our customer. A very simple statement, but trust me, a lot of companies don't do it. You know? In fact, uh, in the business school which I teach, uh, in the early 80s, we didn't care about customer satisfaction. You know, okay? We didn't even do class service, you know, and if the student said something, they don't know anything, you know, kind of attitude. But what you're finding is a lot of changes in that dimension. So what you'll see is one of the key principles of quality management is how do I improve customer satisfaction? The customer is the king. If you satisfy that, you'll be better off, you know. The second aspect is employee involvement and development. Uh, quality management places a premium on people, you know. It's kind of ironic. In a lot of corporations, I think people spend more time thinking about the equipment than the people, you know. And quality management seems to indicate that people are the most important resource, you know. And as a manager, if you're practicing quality management, you really need to involve your people in the day-to-day -day decision making, you know. And more importantly, you really need to create an environment where you can get the best out of the people, you know. So there must be a path with respect to development, you know. And you need to give people opportunities to develop themselves, you know, okay. The third principle is continuous improvement and learning. Uh, we are never happy with the current state of affairs. We constantly want to improve, you know, okay? And that's typically what you'll find in most athletes, you know. They constantly want to do better. And the idea with respect to cooperation is that, okay, we're doing something well. Can we do it better? The second aspect of that is that there must be continuous learning. If I have figured out a better way of doing certain things, I should be willing to share it with everybody else in the corporation. So continuous improvement and learning, that becomes the third principle. And the fourth principle is partnership with customers and suppliers. Often what you'll find is that we tend to have very adversarial relationship with our suppliers and sometimes even with customers, you know. And what quality management seems to tell you is that we need to build strong relationship and very close relationship with this thing, okay? Now it's kind of interesting when you look at these four principles, most of you will say, well, these are commonsensical. They're very easy to understand and very easy to talk about. The problem is that when you try to implement that, it's not that easy. And the reason it's not that easy is because it requires a cultural change. And managing change is not something which many corporations are good at, you know. So they sort of look at these principles, say, very easy, straightforward thing, let's apply it. But what it requires is managing change. And they're not very good at that, you know. And my own personal experience hasn't been very good in implementing these principles, you know. I had only one experience. I tried to implement these principles in my house, and I failed, I failed miserably, you know. And the reason I failed miserably is that my family asked me for facts. You know, they said, okay, if you apply these principles, can you tell us that our you know, happiness or whatever way you measure a family, whether that's going to become better? And unfortunately, I didn't have any facts. You know. And when I talk about facts, I'm reminded of the following quote, which goes as follows. Without facts, you're just another person with an opinion, unless you're at the level of an organization where your opinion becomes facts. You know. 
Unfortunately, in my house, I'm not at that level where my opinion becomes fact. You know? So if I want to do something, I have to actually convince them via facts that this is good stuff. You know? And that's true with a lot of managers also. You know? I mean, you can go and talk to managers and say, this is good stuff. And I think if you supplement your opinions with facts, people are more willing to buy that. You know? And that's what I try to do in this particular research. Now, what's the problem with quality management? If you look at the US, particularly the widely read publications, Business Week, Fortune, Wall Street Journal, which are widely read by top management, in general, what you'll find that these publications basically talk negatively about quality management. So here's a blurb from Business Week. What paradigm is as dead as the pet truck? I mean, a pet truck is what? It's something which has no life in it, you know? Little surprise here, it's total quality management, the approach of eliminating errors and in that increase cost and reduce customer satisfaction promise more than it could deliver, you know, okay? If you look at other publications, they don't have many good things to say about quality management. Uh, here the quote from the Wall Street Journal, very widely read publication, is TKM yesterday's news, or does it still shine? Quality programs show shoddy results. Basically, nothing much there. I like the third one the most, you know, uh, total quality management, you know, so we talk about total quality management, you add the word ED and it becomes total. And it's kind of interesting, when I read that article, I was subscribing to the Washington Post, you know, and I said, oh, that's something interesting here, I looked at it, and they did not give me any facts why quality management is total, you know. And I was so mad with them for publishing that article that I stopped my subscription, you know. Okay? Economists published in UK, I believe, when you think about quality, it's something very solid, you know. Okay, and what we're talking about here is cracks in quality. So that's the kind of article which you see. A few years ago, the Malcolm Baldrige Award winners were announced, and that's the most prestigious quality award that you can win in U.S. And U.S. Today, which is again fairly widely read, welcomed them by asking the question, is TQM dead? You know? So it's kind of interesting that when you look at mainstream publications, they have very few good things to say about quality. Most of the articles are negative. Now, you might say, well, you know, whenever something becomes very popular, you'll always find critics for that, you know. And that's one way to take. But I think it might be useful to step back and think about why these smart people are actually criticizing quality management. And as quality professionals, what can we learn from that, you know. Okay? Uh, there are four main reasons why you'll see a lot of criticism about quality management. And that's sort of capturing the, it's, it's based uh, on my experience in, in U.S., you know. And I think it may apply to other places also. Unrealistic expectations and hype, you know. A lot of organizations which implemented quality management went into this effort having unrealistic expectation of what kind of benefits they would get. They were told that you can get benefits very quickly and the benefits will be huge, you know. Now, anybody who has tried to implement quality management knows that this is not the case. Benefits are slow to come and it takes a long time before you see the benefits, you know. The problem is that when you get into something with unrealistic expectations and you have this high expectations and if those expectations are not met, what's your general feeling? I have not done well, it's not good. You know. So for example, uh, you can think about it, we're going to have the World Cup soccer and I was reading some of the British papers, there's some expectation that England might win the championship. So then that's pretty high expectation. For example, if they lose in the final, a lot of you are going to be very disappointed. But that's still a pretty good achievement. You know. Okay? So I think if you set the expectation unrealistically high, and if you don't meet them, people tend to often consider that to be a failure. And that's been a problem where people have been disappointed, not because quality management did not give any benefits, it simply went into it with very unrealistic expectations. You know. Sloppy research was done in the mid-90s trying to document the value of quality management. And what was the basis of this research? Ironically, it was done by consultants. You know. And what they did was uh, they basically sent out a survey and ask people how they feel about quality management. And a lot of the responses came back and said, we're really not seeing any benefit out of that. You know, there was a survey done in UK, there was a survey done in US, and 30 to 40 percent of the people would say, yeah, we've seen some benefit, but the majority would say there are no benefits. You know? And basically what they're doing is they're sending out a survey asking some very qualitative question, rate this thing on a five-point scale, there's no hard data. But that's the kind of survey which publications have picked up and basically splashed in the news item articles talking about quality management. And it's ironical, those consultants first helped establish quality management program, then they said, our survey said, this stuff is not working, so you've got to call us back, you know, so it's kind of double dipping, you know. Poor scorekeeping. A lot of companies have improved their performance, 
but they really have not linked the improvement in performance to bottom line, you know, okay? So, for example, they have said our customer satisfaction has gone up, our defect rates have gone down, you know, or we are able to respond much faster. And when managers talk about these metrics in front of Wall Street analysts, the first question is what kind of benefits have you got out of that from the bottom line perspective? And they're not able to link it together, okay? So it's like watching a cricket match and keeping track, somehow having some idea about who is doing well, but not knowing exactly how many runs were scored and so on. You know. So we really have, they've not been able to link it to the bottom line, and that's a major problem. Yeah. And competition among management paradigm. I mean, consultants and academics like us, uh, we are in the business of inventing new management paradigms, and we've got to sell it to the audience. How do you sell it? Well, the old paradigms didn't work, you know. And it's very easy with respect to quality management to identify examples of companies which won prestigious quality award and subsequently went bankrupt, you know. And there have been a couple of Baldrige Award winners which have gone bankrupt. You know. It's kind of also interesting that when you look at some of the new management paradigm, they are basically what I would call as old wine in a new bottle. You know. It's repackaging of quality management principles into a new paradigm. You know. And the fact that we don't have strong evidence why quality management hasn't worked or has worked, uh, these sort of publicity tends to hurt us. You know. okay? So for example, people talk about Six Sigma. And I've come across companies which say, we're not practicing six, we're not practicing quality management, but we're doing Six Sigma, you know. Now, it's kind of interesting, if you look at the basic principles of Six Sigma, I challenge you to find how this four principle, which I mentioned earlier on, does not apply, you know. But Six Sigma sells, TQM does not sell, you know, okay? So, so keep those things in mind, you know. How have we responded to these kind of criticism? And I think that the response has been what one would call very academic. Theory and common sense tells us that this should work, you know. How can focusing on customer, how can focusing on people, how can continuously improving does not work, you know. So you're sort of appealing to the inner self, the theory saying, ah, oh, the theory sounds good, you know. And the critics have basically come and said, give us some evidence. And what evidence have we given them? We have identified anecdotes of companies which have been very successful. So people used to talk about Selectron. How many of you have heard about the company Selectron? Fairly big contract manufacturing companies, okay, or even Xerox for that matter, okay. And people give examples of Xerox and Selectron, and look at these companies, they won the Baldrige Award winner, look at what happened to the share price, you know. The critics basically came back and said, okay, look at a couple of the Baldrige Award winners, which went bankrupt, you know. The point I'm trying to make is that anecdotes can prove or disprove a particular point. You know? For every good anecdote, I can give you a bad anecdote. So really, we're not getting anywhere, you know, okay. So that's the second part, anecdote of success story, that really does not make the case. And the third thing people basically said is you cannot establish the link between TQM and financial performance. It's just a very hard link to establish. So what do we do? Just do it on the basis of faith. Trust me, it's good stuff, go ahead and do it, you know. Unfortunately, the real world doesn't work that way. When you're making investment in quality management, there's a significant investment of dollars and significant investment of a people's time. And top management is interested in knowing whether it will pay off. At least what's the probability that there's going to be some positive return, you know? And in US, uh, directors and vice presidents of quality, they have been posed that question, you know, guys, we send all our people on training, we spend this much amount on training, where's the benefit? And they've not been able to establish it. So what you see here is basically two camps. One talking about, yeah, this stuff is great, it's the best thing that has happened to business world. Another camp which is basically saying this stuff doesn't work, you know? And you see this debate constantly going on. And the question is, how do we resolve the debate? Not by shouting louder, but by simply using facts. You know? And that's what my research tried to do, is take a very objective view of quality management and see what's the benefit. If it's great, it's something we should, we should do. If it's really not leading to any returns, what's the point of wasting our time, you know? Okay? Now, if you're, not, if you're eager to know the answer, you know what the answer is. Because if I had said quality management does not work, they probably wouldn't have invited me, you know? So, so from that perspective, it's, it's good news, you know? Oh, oh. Mm. <clears throat> so what my research tries to do is basically answer two fundamental questions. How does effective implementation of quality management affects profitability? Uh, we're talking about, and I'll, I'll describe these measures in some more detail. And the second question is, how does it affect shareholder value? Now, how many of you invest in the stock market? Uh, trust me, when you get your first job or when you have a little spare money, you're going to put some money in the stock market, you know. And at least in the U.S. environment, since top management compensation is very strongly tied to its company's stock price, if I can establish the link between quality management and stock price, 
top management is, will be more willing to listen to me, you know. Okay? And more importantly, you can't do quality management without top management involvement. So you really have to sell the stuff to the top management of a company. And one way to do that is to actually link it to shareholder value. So in other words, if you have implemented quality management principles effectively, does it lead to improved shareholder value or improved stock returns? And if the answer is yes, that should be kind of positive news. You know? So these are the two basic questions which we try to answer. And we want to be able to answer it in a very objective manner. I don't bring my biases into this analysis. You know? okay? And I'll show you how I've done it and how I avoided those biases. What are some of the performance variables that I'm going to talk about? First thing, from a profitability perspective, I'm going to look at growth and operating income. Now, what is the operating income? That's your revenue minus your manufacturing costs minus the selling and general administration costs. I don't look at the net income after taxes and those kind of things because tax laws can change, you know. And, you know, managers can sort of sometimes play games with that stuff and can have an impact on that, you know. So I'm fundamentally focusing on what's your operating profit. Revenue minus your cost. And by implementing quality management, has that stuff gone up, you know, okay? Now, your income will go up because your revenues are doing better. So what I'm going to examine is what's been my growth in revenue. By implementing quality management principles, have I done better in terms of revenue growth? Your profitability can go up if you're able to reduce cost or become more efficient. So I'm going to look at what happens to your efficiency when you try to implement quality management principles. And the two measures which I'm going to look at here are operating return on sales. That is, for every dollar of sales, how much profit are you making? If you become efficient, this number should actually go up. Okay? The second one which I look at is operating return on assets. Every dollar which you invest in your company, how much money are you making? If this number goes up, you become more efficient. So that's kind of looking at the accounting side. And then I'll come back and talk to you about the stock price performance or the shareholder value. Okay? So these are the four metrics. I'm going to look at four or five metrics. And I'm not going to tell you how to do it. I mean, there's enough literature out there which tells you how to do it, if you want to do it. You know? What I want to do is sort of make the business case whether you should do it or not. You know? okay? So how do we carry out this, um, this uh, research? Uh, <clears throat> One of the key challenges I faced here was identifying companies which have implemented quality management effectively. If you send out a survey and ask companies, are you doing quality management, trust me, you'll get close to 100% response. And everybody will say, yes, we're doing it. You know? Nobody wants to be left behind. The question is, how many of them are doing it effectively? That's the key thing. You know? So the, the challenge I faced is, how do I identify firms which are practicing this effectively? One way that I can go to the firms assess their quality management system, and then make a judgment. Uh, first of all, I don't have the resources to do that. I know, go to 500, 600 companies. And even if I did that, my own personal biases will show up. You know, people will say, well, you are biased, and that kind of stuff. You know? So what I decided to do was focus on those companies which have won any type of quality award. Okay? So quality award is the proxy for effective quality management implementation. And it's not a bad proxy, because you generally tend to win quality awards if you have an effective implementation. People which give out quality awards don't just give it out because they feel good about you. They actually do an evaluation of your quality management system. You know? okay? So some of you are probably familiar with the British Quality Foundation Award. And if you have looked at that particular criteria, there is a rigorous evaluation process there. And they're not giving it to everybody. So if you meet the standards and the criteria, that's when you get it. And it's kind of interesting is that I'm not making the judgment. There's an independent set of people who have actually made the judgment that this company actually deserves a quality award. And more importantly, we tend to use quality award winners as role models. You know? So anytime you look at a paper on quality management, they're generally going to point out to some of the quality award winners as examples of role model. You know? So it's not a bad proxy. You know? I spent a fair amount of time collecting information from about 140 different award givers in the United States. And I'll talk a little bit about that in the next slide. Uh, pretty much I spent about three years just writing to these companies and saying, guys, all I want from you is the winners of your quality award. I don't want you to tell me how well or how poorly they did. Can you just give me the names? You know? okay? By the time I spent two and a half, three years collecting the data, and it's not easy. Companies don't give that out very easily, and you constantly have to follow up with them and so on. I had about 5,000 names or organizations in the U.S. which have won quality award. What I decided to do was only focus on 600 of these. And these 600 award winners were what I would call as publicly traded companies. 
In other words, these companies that traded on the New York, American, and NASDAQ stock exchange. Why do you want to focus on publicly traded companies? Their financial information is on the public domain, you know. Okay? I mean, on my laptop, I have stock price information from 1926 to 2004, you know. So we have these extensive databases where stock price information of each and every firm which has been traded in these three exchanges is electronically available and easy to access. I have accounting information, your balance sheet, your income statement for the last 40 years. You know. So I mean that again is a database. So all publicly available company, that information is in the public domain. So the first thing it does is it's easy to get financial information. The second thing is, as you'll see in a moment, I want financial information over a 10 year time period. And I'll tell you why in a moment. Nobody is going to give me 10 years worth of financial information if I send out a survey. I give me 10 years worth of financial information, the response rate is going to be zero. Third thing is that you say, what's your return on assets? Trust me, you ask 10 people, they'll have 10 different definitions. But by looking at financial data, I have a consistent set of data, and I can define my performance variables consistently. Okay? So that's sort of the power of using these 600 companies because they're in the public domain and the financial information is available. Now I have the 600 companies, the next question becomes over what time period should I measure their performance? And what I do here is identify two five year, two time periods, each five years in length. The first is a five year time period before you win the first quality award. I call that as the implementation period. That's the time when you're trying to implement quality management principle which ultimately led to the recognition of quality award. Why do I want to look at the implementation period? I've talked to you about the challenge of implementing quality management principle, change is difficult, Quite possible that when you try to implement this, you might actually suffer some pain, you know, financially. And if I want to be objective, I want to tell you what kind of pains you're going to suffer if you try to implement that. So I want to look at a five-year implementation period. Why five years? It's a nice round number. You can't really have a good implementation in six months, that's for sure. Typically, it can easily take you about three to five years to get a good implementation going. And that's the reason I look at that. Okay? Now you have an effective implementation. I want to look at your performance after that, you know. Okay, so what happens to your financial performance after that? Again, I look at a five-year time period. I call it the post-implementation period. Why do I choose five-year time period? Because gains from quality management does not happen suddenly. It's slow and steady gain. If I measure over a very short time period, I might miss it, you know. So over a long term period, those things might accumulate. An analogy here might be, it's like you have a, you know, let's say, uh, you know, you can reduce weight by going through surgery, and you might see instant change, or you can do it by exercising. Exercising is a much slower process, you know. So quality management is like that, you know. The gains are going to come slowly, so I need to measure it over a longer time period. Now, some of you might say, well, you're looking at financial performance. Financial performance is influenced by what's happening in the economy or what's happening in that particular industry, right? That's always going to be there. If the economy is doing well, even if you don't practice quality management principles, your financial performance is going to improve. So what I do is, for each of these 600 companies, I identify another publicly traded company which hasn't won a quality award, is in the same industry as the award winner, and roughly the same size. So what I now have is 1,200 companies, 600 which have won the award, 600 which haven't won the award. I measure the change in the performance of the award-winning companies. I do the same thing for the non-award-winning companies. I look at the difference. You know. And if this difference comes out to be strongly positive or positive, yeah, strongly positive, that's good news. If you don't find anything, let's move on to something else. You know. The methodology which I've talked about is very simple. In fact, if some of you are working in pharmaceutical industry and you look at the drug development process, it's exactly the same. The company says, okay, we've got a drug which might, make, which might treat this particular disease. How do you test it? You give it to a sample of people who are suffering from the disease, and then you also have a control sample. And you look at the difference in the performance. You know, okay? So that's the basic idea here. You know. Think of quality management as a drug. 600 companies have chosen to take it. The other 600 companies haven't. Let's look at the difference in performance, okay? <clears throat> Let's look at, um, I, okay, this is kind of giving you a partial list of award givers which I included in my sample. If you look at customers that give awards, what you find in US, and I think to a large extent also true in UK, is that large manufacturing and service companies tend to have supplier quality award system for their suppliers. So if you are a supplier to this company, they expect you to apply for that award and hopefully meet the expectations. You know? And if you meet the expectation, you get rewarded. You know? So what you see here is most of the automotive companies which are operating in the U.S. have well-functioning supplier quality award. Tex, um, 
we also have companies like Eastman Kodak, IBM, uh, Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing, that's a 3M, even NASA, the space agency in US, they have an award system for their contractors. You know? Texas Instruments started this award, supplier award system in the early 80s. You know? And again, so what it's really trying to do is give some feedback to the suppliers to improve their quality, and when they have done it effectively, actually reward them with this recognition. This recognition is meaningful. You know? People can say we won an award from Texas Instrument, and that can open doors in other places. The second group of award winners are what I call an independent award givers. I don't really have to supply anything to this organization, but I can choose to apply for that award. So the Malcolm Baldrige Award is an example of that. Uh, companies are not really providing any service to that organization, but they can choose to apply for that. Uh, also in the United States, what you'll find is that most states have their own quality awards. You know, so I come from Georgia, so we have a, what is called the Georgia Oglethorpe Award. If you have a major establishment in that particular state, you can apply for that state's award. You know. Okay, so I include all these award winners in my sample. And the reason I point out these differences, customer award versus an independent award, is that later on we'll see that your financial performance to some extent is a function of what kind of award you win. You know. okay? And I'll talk about that a little later. But just to give you a sense about you know, uh, some of the award givers which have that. I know, for example, Rolls-Royce has an award system, I believe, for the suppliers. But a lot of manufacturing companies you'll see in UK also, and it's really a good thing, you know, uh, because it provides suppliers with some good feedback, you know. Okay, I know you have been patient, so let's start looking at some results, you know. Okay, uh, implementation period—that's the time period when you are actually trying to implement these quality management principles. And see here, if I look at this change in the performance of the 600 award winners and the 600 non-award winners, basically there's no difference in the performance, you know. To me, this is kind of good news because it tells me that if I try to implement quality management principles, on average, I'm not going to suffer financially. And that's very critical, at least in the US environment, where managers often are fixated on next quarterly earnings. You know? And part of that is driven by this Wall Street mentality that I need to meet the analyst expectation. And therefore, they're hesitant. You know, should I do this thing? What happens to the earnings in the short term? You know? And what you're finding is that during implementation period, there's really no difference. I can't tell the difference between the award winners and the non-award winners. So it's basically a low-risk investment. You know. Sure, you're sending some people for training. You're probably spending some money there. But more often than not, it's really not the cash outflow which matters. What matters is sort of realigning your people or your processes. That's what you're trying to do here. You know. And even if you're spending some money, you get the benefits of what we call the low-hanging fruits easy to improve opportunities, and the benefits which you get basically pay itself. You know? So if there are high implementation costs, those implementation costs are basically paid off during the implementation period by the improvements which you make. Yeah. I don't know the real reason why we don't see differences in performance. To me, what's important is good news. It's a low-risk investment. You know? okay. Now, when you come to the implementation, post-implementation period, I have something different to report. You know? And what you see is some remarkable differences in performance. What I have here are basically two sets of numbers. Uh, the numbers in the green bar tells you what happens to the performance of the award-winning companies. And the number in the blue bar tells you what happens to the performance of the benchmark companies. So the 600 award winners are in green, and the 600 um, non-award winners are in blue. And these numbers are basically averages. Okay, so I'm reporting the mean here. Okay. And it's kind of interesting to sort of look at each number turn by turn. Look at operating income. Over a five-year time period, award-winning companies improved their operating income by 86%. So think of it this way. Around the time when they won their first quality award, they were making $100 million in profit. Five years later, their profits are about $186 million. So that's an 86% improvement. The benchmark company, which probably are not practicing quality management to the same extent, also improved their performance by about 43%. And part of the reason is that if you look at the 90s, and that's where most of the data is coming from, the US economy was generally booming. You know, we had very few recessionary periods. You know. So even if you don't practice quality management, but if the economy is booming, your industry is booming, you're going to have higher profit. What is interesting is to look at the difference. 86% you know, versus 43%. What you see here is that award-winning companies, when they have an effective implementation, outperform their competition at twice the rate. You know. And it, this, these numbers are more. Um, the difference is even more significant when you look at what was happening in the implementation period. 
implementation period, there was basically no difference between the award winning company and the non award winning company. So, effective implementation, and then you start seeing improvement in performance. Okay. What happens on the sales side? Award winning companies improve their sales by 62 percent, benchmark companies improve by about 32 percent. Why are the sales going up? You are providing a better product or a better service, and therefore the customers are willing to give you more business. Or the other way you might want to think about it that you are keeping the price constant, but not giving you better product and better service. Uh, so, sorry. Um, another thing is because they are giving a better product and better service, you can demand a higher price. You know. So it could be a combination of both of these factors. But what you see is significant growth in revenues. You know. okay. What happens on the efficiency side? A return on sales improved by 12 percent for the award winning companies. Basically, it did not change for the non award winning companies. So again, what we see is some difference in return on sales, which were the measure of efficiency. So what we are seeing here is some evidence that the efficiency of the award winning companies improved. In other words, they were able to reduce the cost to them. And if you look at return on assets, the same story. If you look at the last one, employment base actually grew by 22 percent for the award winning companies, non award winning companies went up by about 7 percent. And so, so the point here is that award winning companies have not improved their profitability by laying off people. In fact, because they were growing so much faster, they, were, they actually hired more people. And this is the point which I tend to emphasize when I talk to politicians, you know. Uh, particularly, you know, when you, when you want the support for quality movement or quality management efforts. And it is kind of ironic, you know, if you look at organizations which practice, which support quality management, they are really not asking for too much money, you know. Maybe $100,000 at a state level or $200,000 at a state level. And if you look at typical state budgets, I mean, that is peanuts, you know. But politicians are very hesitant to give it for that cause, you know. I mean, they will rather go and sort of repair a road for $200,000 than give it to the quality organization. So I use this, I said, forget about all that stuff. If you support quality management, you are going to see job growth, you know. And that is very critical for them because to some extent, the ability to stay in office depends on employment level to some extent, you know. So, so if you are going to deal with politicians in trying to sort of sell this concept, the employment as, uh, data which I have here in terms of growth and employment would certainly be very useful, you know. Okay. Now, some of you might say, well, you know, whenever you compare sample A with sample B, they are not going to be exactly the same. So, what is the statistical validity of this stuff, you know. In other words, if you look at 86 percent versus 43 percent, you know, I could be lucky. There is nothing happening here, but simply because I am comparing two samples, I have observed these numbers purely by chance, you know. And that is a very valid um, uh, argument. And so I have run some statistical tests on these things, uh, basically to see at what level the difference in mean is significant. And my chances of observing this purely by luck is 1 out of 200, you know. So it is sort of these numbers are significant at the 1 percent level. And that is the kind of luck which we are allowed to claim in management studies, you know. Okay. Uh, what you see here is basically five years worth of research, you know. I mean, it took me about five years to get to this point, and uh, because with all the data collection, cleaning it up, and so on. And the other day, I was, uh, you know, a couple of years back when I was putting this together, my daughter was around eight or nine at that time, and she looked over my shoulder and said, Dad, how long did it take you to do this stuff? So I said, five years, you know. So, with a very straight face, she said, Dad, you need to work more efficiently, you know. So, it happened during Christmas time. Needless to say, she didn't have a very good Christmas, you know. So, Anyway, the point I am trying to make is that if you want to do this stuff rigorously, I mean, you really have to spend time, you know. I mean, I can collect a bunch of anecdotes and try to make a case, but that to me is not the rigorous evidence. Think of it this way. If pharmaceutical companies start selling a drug based on anecdotes, how many of you would buy it, you know? Okay. The fact that we buy those drugs is because it is some, in many cases, I am not saying 100 percent, they are backed by solid rigorous evidence. You know? I mean, data which has been collected very painstakingly over a long time period. Now, the next question is, um, okay, this is kind of the average numbers. How does the performance vary depending on the firm characteristics, you know? And one of the segmentation which I did here was uh, segment my sample into small and large companies. So, basically, I look at the asset values of the company. I sorted them and the company which had the highest asset right on the top, lowest asset on the bottom, I basically segmented it in the middle, you know. So, 50 percent of the companies I call as smaller companies, 50 percent of the companies are larger companies, you know. Now, the set of numbers which I am going to report here are somewhat different than what I reported in the previous chart. 
in the previous chart, I also told you, I gave you the numbers for the benchmark. I said 86% versus 43%, okay? So I gave you. Here I'm not doing that. Each and every number which you see here has been adjusted for the performance of the benchmark. In other words, I've subtracted the performance of the benchmark and then reported these numbers, you know. So the way you would look at these numbers is that if you look at the small companies here, which is 63%, uh, small companies which effectively implement quality management principles outperform their competition or those benchmark companies by 63%. Large companies which effectively implement quality management principles also outperform their benchmark by 22%. So that's the important thing is I've already given you the net performance, okay? So the good news here is it really does not matter whether you're a large company or a small company, the benefits are going to be there. What you find here is that small companies tend to get more benefit than larger companies. And there might be a couple of reasons for that. In a larger company, what happens is that, let's say for example, General Motors, and they have a division called the Cadillac division, luxury car, and they won the Baldrige Award. You know? So they're actually in my sample. Now ideally, I should be looking at the performance of the Cadillac division. What happened to the sales and the profitability of the, unfortunately, I can't get that information. I don't get the information at the division level. So what I'm looking at is overall performance of GM. Now the other divisions may not be as effective in implementing the TQM principles. So even if Cadillac made some significant improvements in profitability, when I average it over the other divisions, the average tends to come down. Smaller firms, that may not be the case. When you won a quality award, it's likely to cover a major portion of your business. You know? okay? And that's something which might be actually driving this thing. There's no way I can avoid that. Uh, so if you had to make the case, you might be sort of cautious about it and you say, you know, smaller companies' performance is more indicative of what we might get out of quality management. So if some of these larger companies affect quality management throughout the company, then we may see similar kind of numbers, you know. The other reason is it's a lot harder to implement quality management in a larger organization. I had spent some time working with GM and uh, again sort of we had the first the initiation meeting with my boss. And his first comment was, you know, GM is like an elephant, you know. And uh, try to bring about change, particularly when the elephant does not want to move. So it's like, it's that tough, you know. And I think in a larger company, simply there's more inertia. So the benefits might be even slower to get, change might be more expensive, and therefore it might take even longer to get those benefits, you know. But the good news is it does not matter whether you're a large firm or a small firm. If you implement these principles, it's going to benefit you. What happens if you are in a low capital intensive environment versus a high capital intensive environment? What we see here is that uh, low capital intensive companies tend to do better or they have a much stronger outperformance than high capital intensive companies. Uh, what, what are some of the industries which might be low capital intensive? Particularly the service side I would say might be low capital intensive. You know? okay? And again, this is a very important finding particularly for countries for developing nations you know which are much more labor intensive than US UK and other countries you know and the point here is that if on a large scale they are able to implement quality management principle they should see significant improvement in performance based on this results you know uh, high capital intensive we see some improvement but not that much and part of the reason is in a capital intensive environment a lot of the improvements are actually built into the equipment in some sense I mean you're very equipment dependent you know so the opportunity for improvements might be somewhat limited. In a labor intensive environment, it's the people which are really doing most of the work. You have more minds working together, more opportunities for improvement, and that might be actually getting reflected here. But the good news is it does not matter whether you are a high capital intensive industry or a low capital intensive industry, you still see benefit. That does not mean that if you are a high capital intensive industry, you suddenly try to convert that into a labor intensive environment. I mean, that's not going to, I mean, if you're manufacturing semiconductors, there's no way it can be a labor intensive environment. It's just that the impact of quality management can be different in different environments, you know. The next one is, um, is an interesting one. Um, remember I talked to you about those uh, two different types of award winners. One winning awards from the customers, and I call them as customer award winners, and the other one is the independent award winners. What you see here is that if you have won an independent award like the Baldridge or the British Quality Foundation Award or if the EFQM Award, generally the benefits are much more than simply winning an award from your customers. Okay? But also it's kind of interesting to note that even if you win an award from the customer, 
you tend to improve your profitability. You know. So it's not a bad thing to do. In fact, the first thing you want to do is make sure you meet your customer needs. You know. So if you're supplying to the automotive industry, they have a supplier quality award system, make sure you can meet that standard. You know. okay. The question is, why do we see this big difference? You know? And there are a number of reasons for that. The first one is the following, is that if you look at the criteria typically used by companies to evaluate their suppliers, that criteria might basically run to two to four pages. You know. On the other hand, if you look at the Baldrige Award or the EFKM Award, that criteria can run to 50 pages, you know, single space. You know, and it's, it's, it's a very dense thing. So what you, what, what you see is that independent award winners tend to use an evaluation criteria which I think is a lot more comprehensive and a lot more covering than perhaps customers. You know. Customers don't have the time to spend five days to do the evaluation and they can, I mean, it's just not going to happen. You know. But they're sort of focusing on some basic things and they're saying as, you get, as soon as, you, as, uh, as long as you get some of the basic things well, we're willing to reward you. Know. But the independent award givers want to go one step further. You know. So essentially what you see is that if you win an independent award, it's kind of telling me that your quality award system has a very high level of maturity then let's say if you win an award only from your customers. You know. okay? The second thing is that the evaluation process for independent awards is a lot tougher than what a company would typically use to evaluate the supplier. Uh, for example, in the case of Baldridge, there will be 10 independent examiners looking at your written applications and then you'll go to three other stages before they finally decide on the winner. Uh, customers are not going to spend that much time. You know. I mean, they might spend a few hours looking at your systems and kind of make some judgment. You know. So again, sort of the evaluation criteria is different. Third thing is that the competition for independent award is even tougher. The best of the best tend to apply for these independent awards, whereas in the customer award, anybody can apply in some sense. You know. okay? So these kind of, when you look at the differences, it's not surprising that if you win an independent award winner, that tells you that it has a very high level of maturity, that your quality management system has a very high level of maturity. If you're only winning a customer award, probably you have a lower level of maturity. But even if you have a lower level of maturity, you do see some benefits. In other words, you have to start somewhere to build your quality system. And then you might want to think about raising it to the next level so that it's capable of winning an independent award. You know. The analogy I use here is, um, is the following, is that winning an independent award, winning, winner, winning an independent award is like winning the 100 meter dash in the Olympics. Winning an award from the customer is like winning the 100 meter dash at the state level or maybe at the country level, you know. And you know, you know which one gives you more benefits. I mean, value in a sense, you know. I mean, recognition or endorsement and those kind of things. And obviously, winning at the Olympics is a lot tougher. There's a lot more competition. You've got to train very differently and train in very, you know. So, so some of those same factors are getting reflected here, you know. I mean, uh, the comprehensiveness of the criteria, the competition, and the evaluation process, that basically picks the best. Okay. But the good news is that even if you have a basic level of maturity, you still tend to see improvement in performance. So that kind of should be good news, you know. Okay, so we've talked about accounting numbers, and um, some of you might actually get into this stock picking business, uh, run your own mutual fund or financial advisory services. And um, so the question then becomes is, uh, does buying stock of award winners result in higher returns? In other words, that if I invested in companies which practice quality management, will I do better than other companies which probably don't do it? You know? And whenever you talk about stock returns, uh, people want to get quick returns, uh, high returns very quickly. So the next question is, what's the right time to invest? You know? I don't have the patience to wait for five or 10 years. Tell me what's the best time to invest. I invest for two or three years, make my money, and get out. You know? So I'll try to answer that question also here. Uh, the results which I'm going to give you are mainly for the post-implementation period. Now, there's no difference in the stock price performance for the implementation period. And before I talk about the results, I just want to add a caveat that these results are based on past performance. There's no guarantee that if you try to implement this strategy, you're going to get similar returns. You know? So that's the first rule of investment is that if anybody gives you some numbers, it's already it's based on historical numbers, so there's no guarantee. But I think the chances are good that you might actually get a better return. What do we see here? Look at the 600 award winners. Suppose I invest a dollar in each one of those award winners, held the stock of these companies for five years, and sold it. The $500 which I invested actually gave me 114%, sorry, $600 which I invested actually gave me 114% return. In other words, 
I double the value of my portfolio over a five year time period. Okay. Now some of you might say, what's the great deal about, what's the big deal about it? Uh, and some of you might have made big money during the dot com era. You know, now after you exclude the dot com era, uh, doubling your money in five years is a pretty good performance. I'll tell you in a moment. Okay. S&P 500, if you decide not to do that, but invest in the S&P 500, which is the 500 largest stocks in US, just like a financial times index, you would have only got about 80%. So by following this dumb strategy of investing in quality management principles, or companies which adopt this quality management principle, you outperform the S&P 500 over a five year time period by about 34%. That's about 5% a year. You know, 5% a year when you compound it, adds up to about 34%. If you look at some other benchmark portfolio of all stocks which are traded, uh, compare a particular company to the return on a portfolio of stock in the same industry and so on. Whichever way you look at it, what you see that the award winners outperform it. And I've run about 100 different tests here trying to prove myself wrong, you know. That, hey, this difference is basically purely by luck. And unfortunately, I've been, unfortunately, I've been unsuccessful on that, you know. Okay. The question is 114 versus 80%. How good is this outperformance? You know? If you look at actively managed equity funds where we are paying a professional stock picker to invest our money over a five year time period, these people who actively manage stocks, 80% of them or maybe close to 90% of them can beat the S&P 500. So you follow the strategy of investing in quality award winners and you beat all these professional investors. Uh, quite handsomely. You know. So from that perspective, the outperformance which you see here is quite remarkable. You know. And we can look at this outperformance, 114% versus 80%, and we can actually put a dollar value to it. What it means is you created an additional $700 million of shareholder value per company. So based on my sample, I would estimate that because they implemented quality management principle, $700 million per company times 600, that's about $420 billion worth of value. So it's a pretty, pretty remarkable level of outperformance. My only regret when I saw the results was why didn't I act on it, you know. And uh, if I had done, I would probably be happily retired, but that's history, you know, you can't you can repeat that. Uh, and again, as I said, this is based on past performance. It should be an indicator of what you might get in the future. But if you sort of pick two quality award winners and say, I want to, will I get this kind of return? Probably not, you know. What you really need the large sample of companies, you know. Okay, so I have, myself have invested in a few Baldrige Award winners, and uh, you know the the experience hasn't been very good. I mean, I invested in Lucent. I don't know if anybody of you know about that. At one time, it was a high flying stock. Now, uh, traded at around 80. Now it's down to two. You know, so that's one story. I invested in Xerox before they had a lot of the financial manipulation trouble. But there was a company called ADAC Labs, which subsequently got acquired by Philips, and I did make some money on that. You know. But the point is that, you know, just picking three or four companies and placing your bets on that is not the right way to do it. And what I have here is 600 companies. And if you're systematically going to follow this investment policy, the chances of you outperforming the market are pretty good, you know. Okay. The question is, what's the optimal time to invest? I take that five-year time period and break it down into five one-year time period. Okay. So what happens in the first year? Uh, Award-winning companies have 20%, S&P 17%, a 3% difference. Probably not that significant. Second year, exactly 12 and 12. So there's really no difference. Third year, the gap is 5%. Fourth year, the gap is 7%. Fifth year, the gap is 12%. Whenever I put this chart, people say, what happens in the sixth and the seventh year? You know, Because you see this gap widening. You know. And my response is, I honestly don't know. Because when you're doing research, it's very easy to do data mining. You know, keep looking till you find something and then report it, you know. And if you really want to do rigorous research, you have to upfront say, here's what I'm going to do, and I'll report whatever I get. It's a very strong temptation to avoid, you know. I mean, people have seen done that, you know. They want to address this issue first three years, they don't find, they look fourth year, fifth year, sixth year, till they find something. So honestly, I don't know the answer. We decided up front we're going to look at five years after you win the quality award, and here's what the results are. You know. The second thing is, I'm quite happy with what I got here. You know, I mean, the level of outperformance, about 34 points, is pretty good. You know, who knows what might happen in the sixth or seventh year? Because like anything else, a good thing cannot stay hidden. You know, 
if I'm outperforming my competition by 12%, 5%, 7% every year, my competition either will have to go out of business or they're going to adopt the same thing. Okay? And in which case, there's going to be a point of diminishing marginal return. You know? so I don't know the answer to that. Over a five-year time period, which is sort of more than the horizon of most active investors, what you see here is significant level of outperformance. The other interesting thing to note from here is that if you look at the first and second year, you're really not seeing any level of outperformance. And I've also told you that it might take three to five years to implement this program. So what we're talking about is a five to six years worth of effort, and then the benefits start showing up. So if you don't have patience to stick to this kind of principles, and you want to sort of expect something miraculous to happen in one year, that's not going to happen. So if you're getting into quality management principle, be prepared for the long haul, three to five years, and then you start seeing some of the benefits. You know? okay? And the reason I mention that is I know of companies which have invested heavily in quality management. They have done very well in implementing it. They just didn't have the patience a year or two after implementation for the benefits to show up. So they waited for six months, 12 months, nothing happened kind of disbanded or lost interest in the program. So one of the key messages from here is that I need to have patience. If you don't have patience, this is not a paradigm you want to do. My own personal feeling is that in a recessionary period, award winner stock price is going to drop, but it's going to drop less than the benchmark companies. But I don't have at the moment proof for that. Okay? And, and that's precisely why we have these controls, because the controls serve the same function. During boom period, they subtract out the boom, during the recessionary period, they're just for the downturn in the performance, you know. So it's a fair question. I don't have a very good answer to that, you know. Okay? Just uh, my conjecture on that thing. Um, as far as I remember, there were, now, if I look at it this time period, there might be about 12 to 18 months when so-called we were in recession, you know. So uh, that, this might answer your question a little bit. Uh, but it's not as rigorously done as my study. This is a study which is done by a mutual fund in in U.S. and it's kind of a small mutual fund. And what they are doing is that among the many criteria which they use to select stock, one of the criteria is that the management must believe in quality management and must have implemented it effectively. Okay, and they created a portfolio which is called the Q100, and it's like a portfolio of 100 companies which practice quality management quite well. And they basically track this portfolio and compare it against the performance of the S&P 500. That's kind of the rough benchmark which they use. And if you look at it, um, it generally tends to do, generally doing better than the S&P 500. And if you look at the down periods, they were kind of, I would say September 1999, all the way to maybe end of December 2001, it's still outperforming the thing, you know. But again, there are no statistical tests done here, and so from that perspective, it's not as rigorous, you know. But it does, does give you some idea that probably during a recessionary time period, you may still outperform your competition, you know. Okay? So that's another other example, an independent example of uh, the study, of this work. Now, <clears throat> I've talked to you from an accountant's perspective, saying what happens to the profitability. I've talked to you from an investor's perspective, talking to you from a, saying what happens to your stock price. I'll take a third cut at that issue, does quality management pay off, by looking at the experience of one specific company. Okay? And the way I'll do that is the following. If you look at the EFQM criteria, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with that, uh, the EFQM people will say we are different from Baldrige, and the Baldrige people will say we are different from EFQM. But fundamentally, they are all talking about the same thing. They just approach it somewhat differently. So if you look at any quality management criteria, there are really three parts to it. The first part is what you need to do and how well you are doing it. You know? okay, so that's what I call it, what's and how's. And within that, you have these six different categories or areas, leadership, strategic planning, customer and market focus, information and analysis, process management, and human resource management. And you look at the EFQM criteria, they're going to roughly talk about the same thing. They might put different weights on that. But these kind of, people are saying these are good things to do. And if you do these good things well, what's going to happen? Your non-financial performance should improve. Your processes should start doing better. Your customers should be happy. 
and your people are happy. Okay, so that's kind of the second aspect of the model. And if your processes are doing well, people are happy and customers are happy, what do you expect to see? My financial performance should improve. Okay, so when I talked about the previous results, what I did was I basically missed out on the middle part. I went from assuming that what and how are being done effectively, what's the implication on financial performance, you know. Okay, and what I'm going to share with you is the experience of one pharmaceutical company when they adopted this quality management system. It's a, it's a company which basically does, has never applied for Baldrige and it never plans to do it, you know, for various reasons. But they've used the Baldrige criteria to do self-assessments. And essentially what happens in this self-assessment is each business unit is required to take the Baldrige criteria, write up an application, and then, you know, a bunch of examiners will actually evaluate them, you know. So every applicant gets a score, okay. So what I had was data on percent score in each category. So if leadership is assigned 100 points, this particular business unit got 50, I have 50% of the score, you know, okay? And then I had data from 200 such assessments. So I had scores on assessments for the six categories, what's and how. I had scores on the assessment for non-financial non -financial performance, and then I had scores on the financial side. Everything converted into percent. And what the theory tells me that if you do the what's and how as well, in other words, if you score more there, you should expect to see improvement in non-financial metrics of performance, which in turn should lead to improvement in financial metric. That's kind of the basic linkage, you know, okay? Let's see what do we find there. I'm going to show you a bunch of charts, and in each of these charts, the x-axis is basically the percent score on the six categories I talked about, leadership, strategic planning, and so on. I've compressed everything together, and I said, what's your percent score on the what's and how? But, you know, depending on your environment, some, company, some people might want to focus more on the process, others might want to focus more on the customer side, you know, and they might still have the same average score. So obviously, if you are on the, from the zero to 20 percent range, you're probably not doing very well on the what's and how's. If you get to 60 to 70 percent range, you're probably on the high end, you know. And on the y-axis, I'll have a particular dimension of performance. In this particular case, I have what I call as process results, you know. How well are my process behaving? What's my defect rate? What's my uptime? What's my lead time? And those kind of things, you know. So, and what you see here is a positive relationship between process results and the what's and how. If you score well on the what's and how's, you expect to see, or you're seeing a positive result on the process side. In other words, my processes are doing a lot better, okay? If you look at the next chart, pretty much the same data except that the dependent variable here is customer results, you know. How loyal are my customers, how satisfied are my customers, and those kind of things. So I have sort of a composite score on that. And again, what you see that if you do well on the what's and how's, you see a improvement in those sides. So it's kind of nice to know that in this particular pharmaceutical company, divisions which did better on the what's and how's showed better process results and better customer results. You know. okay? And the relationship is quite strong here in some sense. And then I combine the process and the customer results. I call them as non-financial results. And obviously, you will expect to see this positive correlation. Okay? This chart looks at the financial results. So we have scored these business units also on the financial side and established a relationship between the what's and how. We do see a positive relationship, but it doesn't appear to be as strong as what we saw in the previous charts. But still, the good news is there's a positive relationship. Why are the relationships sometimes weak? Well, financial results can be influenced by a lot of factors over which you don't have any control. So the government comes and says, you know, we are going to have some kind of a price control. What's that going to do to your financial performance? You might do the same process, same customer satisfaction, but the price control actually brings the margins down. Or there might be some new environmental regulations or some government regulations which you need to deal with it, which actually increases expenses. But nonetheless, what we see here is that we see a strong positive correlation between financial performance and how well you do on the what's and how's, you know. So when you put all of them together, the financial and the non-financial side, what you basically see is a pretty strong correlation between the what's and how's and the performance, you know. And that should be compelling evidence in some sense on why we want to do this thing. There are many companies in the U.S. where top management generally goes through this assessment process, and what they're looking at is company-wide, 
are my average scores actually going up or not? And if they are, that's kind of an indication that we are practicing this pretty well, you know, okay. Uh, one more, I uh, want to share a little bit, and I know you have a speaker from Australia coming, maybe that person will talk more, but just in case he doesn't, I wanted to share with you a study done in, by Alexander Hosner at the University of Wollongong in Australia. And Australia also had the quality award at the country level. And what he did was he looked at 22 manufacturing firms that applied for the Australian Quality Award. And for these 22 companies, he actually identified 10 key performance indicators and actually tracked the performance of these companies on these indicators for the next seven years. You know. So he had about seven years worth of data on how well the company did on the self-defined uh, uh, performance indication. And his hypothesis was that high evaluation scoring organizations are much more likely to belong to the best performing organization. It's the same kind of idea which I was talking about previously. If you do wells on the Watson house, you should expect to see an improvement in performance. And he was trying to test this based on 22 Australian companies who went through the Australian Quality Awards. So he was able to get the scores from the organization. And then he subsequently tracked the metrics of these, uh, the performance of these companies. Okay? And basically what he finds based on the sample of 22 is that there is a strong correlation there. Okay? So if you look at the x-axis, that's basically the score they got on the evaluation when they submitted the application. And if you look at the y-axis, that's kind of giving you the average KPI improvement. You know? okay? So that's kind of the Australian experience. Again, based on a fairly small sample, but what's nice about this particular study is that they were able to track this performance over the next five to seven years, you know, okay, and then kind of come up with some kind of composite performance metrics, and what you see is a positive improvement. So one of the challenges which you will see as you apply these principles in your own organization once you finish school is people are going to say, okay, all this evidence is great, you know, yeah, I'm really convinced about this stuff. But how can, you, how can one link TQM to performance in my own organization? I mean, I'm willing to implement this stuff, but how do we establish that linkage? You know? okay? And the number of ways in which you can do that, one is if you're going through some kind of assessment, you can tr keep track of these assessment scores. You know? Just like what I did with respect to the pharmaceutical company, on average, they can look at how well are we doing on the assessment. And if these assessment scores are improving, and I know the correlation between assessment scores and financial performance, that should be a rough indication that it's working in our organization. So, so from your perspective, if you're running the quality programs or the quality management implementation, uh, the key criteria would be, are my assessment scores actually going up, you know, on a year-to-year -year basis? That would be an indication of effectiveness, you know. Okay? The second thing you could do in trying to convince skeptics in your own organization is you can keep track of the cost and benefits at a project level. In an individual company, sometimes it might be hard to sort of take all the activities you're doing with respect to quality management and assign a bottom line to it, you know. Okay, it's going to be very difficult to do that. And there might be so many other factors which might be affecting the performance of the company, and you may not be able to control for all of them, you know. Okay, so what you can do is you can actually define quality projects where you had a specific problem, you applied quality management principles, and you made improvements on that dimension. What you can do is you can keep track of your performance before you started, then you made the changes, look at what happened after you made the changes. So you can compare the before performance with the after performance. You might be able to convert them into a bottom line number, and you can do it for some selected projects. You don't have to do it for everything, you know. And that kind of becomes your scorecard that in these projects, here's the investment we made, here's the improvement we made, and that's the impact on the bottom line. The reason I mention this thing is that in corporate world, CEOs come and go, you know, and with today's sort of pressure on improved performance, the average life of a CEO in many companies might be three to five years. And when the new person comes in, he or she wants to make uh, their own splash in the organization. And he or she is going to evaluate all the existing program. And TKM is one of the programs they're going to look at. And if you don't have solid evidence to back up why they should continue in that direction, you could be in trouble. You know? And I've seen that in many companies where people talked about it, but they just did not have the evidence, and with limited resources, those money was moved elsewhere. You know. So it's very important from, from your perspective, in order to continue this idea in the organization and convince the skeptics that you have a scorecard about what's been the value of TQM in your organization.
tracking your assessment scores is an indication. And the other way you might want to think about is projects, you know. Okay. A good example of that is uh, G Six Sigma. In 1995, G started doing Six Sigma, and it's like in the in the U.S. it was like Six Sigma is something very new, but actually that's not the case. In the mid 80s, Motorola invented Six Sigma, but Motorola is kind of a boring company, you know, I mean, for some reason. But when Jack Wells said, "I'm doing Six Sigma," everybody tends to listen. But whatever the reason. And he did Six Sigma not because it's a good thing to, because everybody's talking about it. He did it because he believed it's going to lead to a financial payback. And he made sure that the investment in Six Sigma was evaluated based on the cost incurred in implementing it and the value which you got. So in GE, every Six Sigma project had the cost associated with it and a value associated with it. And what they do is they add up all the costs, they add up all the value, and it kind of gives them the scorecard. And not only that, they highlight the scorecard in the annual report. Kind of an old number here, but uh, this was something which came out in the 1998 annual report. They started in 1996, and essentially, if you look at the chart, they spend more than what they got. You know, okay. If you look at 1997, they got about a billion dollars back. And they spent about 400, and in 1999, they estimate they're going to spend half a billion dollars implementing Six Sigma projects, and they're going to get two billion dollars back. You know? So here, the four is to one return. So if you in your organization has this, have this kind of statistics, and assuming it's positive, I mean, even if the management changes, they're still going to look at this stuff very favorably. So you really have to have that evidence. You can't just continue using, I mean, the study is sort of trying to get the door open, you know. And you can sort of say, okay, this is something worth looking. But at the end of the day, has it really paid off in my organization? If you don't keep the scorecard, how will you tell people, you know? So that's the second way to think about it. Okay? The third way you can do is you can actually develop what we like to call as a cost of poor quality system. In other words, how much are we spending really in poor quality? You know? Is it 2% of my revenue or is it 20% of my revenue? And if I have an estimate of that, and then when I start making improvements in my system, that becomes my scorecard. You know? okay? Let me just give you an example here. And some of you might be familiar with this, computing the cost of poor quality. Actually, I, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, Juran has been instrumental in sort of advocating some of these ideas, you know. And, you know, Professor Zaid is very actively involved uh, with him, and he has the Juran chair. So next time you come, you may want to surprise him with this stuff, you know, if he hasn't talked to you about that. Basically, the idea is the following, is that there are four categories of costs that I want to keep track of. One is the appraisal cost. And what the appraisal cost does is it tries to make sure that the quality of the product or services which you're providing is good. So what do you do? You do a lot of inspection, you know, for example. And there's nothing wrong with that if that's the best way to ensure quality, you know. You might be doing a lot of testing to ensure that you have the right quality. Uh, you might be maintaining your equipment and so on. And that's sort of making sure that the process produces the quality that you promise, you know. The second set of activities is prevention cost, you know. You make investment prevent poor quality from happening. So things like quality planning, process planning, in fact, a lot of the stuff which you learn in quality management is all about how to prevent poor quality from happening. You know? So for example, the training expenditure which you do, why do you do that? You're expecting that this is going to be a prevention activity because if your people are better trained, they might be able to identify the defects or problems much faster and take care of it. You know? The third category is internal failure cost. You try your best, but you still get some products which are not up to specification. You either have to scrap them, you basically have to rework them. Okay? And sometimes you have to get rid of the product and those kind of things. External failure costs, the product has hit the customer, and the customer is not happy. They're sending the product back, so anything which is involved in sort of get, taking the product back and satisfying the customer, that's an external failure cost. Uh, in many countries, uh, lawyers are very willing to file lawsuits on your behalf when you get bad products, so that litigation cost might be there, warranty cost, and so on. The point here is that you can organize whatever cost you want in these four categories, and these uh, details are not the only one which you want to use. You know? So you can define, you can think about what you consider to be poor quality, and you can try to put them in these four categories. Go to your accountants and say, how much are we spending on these activities? And trust me, first time they'll say we don't know, you know. And you really have to dig deeper into the system to be able to find out. Uh, how many of you know about activity-based costing? Some of you have seen that. That's basically saying, okay, how do you spend the time? I spend my time inspecting products for 50% of the time. Take that person's salary, put it under appraisal, you know. Or I spend my last year actually going through some kind of a training. 
You take that cost, put it under prevention category. The point is that if you spend sufficient amount of time and you dig deeper, you can get dollar values on each one of these costs. And again, you don't have to be very precise, but let's sort of get the ballpark numbers. You, know. you put all of these numbers together, and that tells you what's my cost of poor quality. Now you say I'm implementing quality management principle, you can keep track of what's the cost of poor quality. Let me just give you an example here. <clears throat> this is a case study which was done at Texas Instrument, and they sort of adopted this cost of quality system. And part of the reason is that, you know, if you look at Texas Instrument, very engineering oriented. And what do engineers like? They want numbers, they'll want facts, you know. So if you really want them to do this cost of quality system, you've got to give them some numbers here. Say, so this is how much we are spending. So in 1982, they did that analysis or did that study and they said that 10.7% of the revenues could be grouped into those four cost categories. In a sense, I'm really wasting pretty much about 10.7% of my revenues because of poor quality. Okay? And then they started working on that and in 1987, they brought it down to 7.8%. Okay? It will never go to zero. Why? Because you'll always do some appraisal activity. You're always going to invest in prevention. You know? But hopefully what you can do is you can reduce the internal failure costs, which are expensive, and more importantly, reduce the external failure costs, which are even more expensive. And that's what you'll typically find with the cost of quality system, that sometimes the appraisal and prevention costs might go up, but every dollar which you invest there leads to more than a dollar reduction in internal and external failure. Now, if you have these kind of numbers, that tells me that quality management has worked in your organization. And being able to reduce my cost by 3%, I mean, that's a big number, by the way. Uh, that's, that, that's, a, that's a value of quality management. Uh, Union Pacific Railroad, they did the same kind of thing. Uh, in 1987, they estimated that the cost of quality was 30.5% of revenues. You know. And they were very generous in defining what is cost of poor quality. In other words, if a shipment was delayed by a few hours, they would consider that to be a quality problem. Okay. Anyway, the point is that they estimated it to be 30.5%. They started working on many of these issues, and what you see here is kind of a scorecard. In 1994, they brought it down to 15.9%. Still a high number, but uh, certainly something uh, which can be used to justify why quality management efforts are important. Yeah, go ahead. So as they brought, brought, down, brought the quality up and made everything drop, did they see an increase in the share price? I don't know that. Um, <clears throat> okay, the, <clears throat> the question is, um, did this particular company see an increase in share price? I don't know the answer to that. This is just an example which I'm, I'm giving you. If I had to guess, 30.9, 30% 30 throwing away to 15, certainly. But see, sometimes it's kind of interesting when you look at share price for an individual company. Now, if you can think about it, managers have too much money. So you can see some other things might happen, you know. Okay, they could make a bad investment. I mean, it does not guarantee that, you know. But what I was saying here is that, in a local sense, if I put the boundary around the cost of quality, which I'm trying to manage, yeah, we gave you significant dollars back, you know. Okay, so my guess would be, yeah, share price may have gone up, but I won't bet on that, you know. And that's why what you need to do when you look at these kind of studies, rather than look at one particular company, if I had 50 or 100 of these companies which implemented cost of quality, and the average share price went up. That, to me, would be more solid evidence. You know? Okay, so, and you know, ultimately, it is going to affect the bottom line. You know, okay? so that's kind of the third way you can do that. And the final way is the last one. And it's a pretty big thing, and I'm going to read it, and then I'll give you an example to just kind of illustrate that. Um, developing quantitative relationship between leading indicator of process, employee, and customer performance, and linking it to financial performance. In some sense, this is the same thing which we talked about, the what's and how's. You know? If you think about what's and how, what are they really focusing on? They're focusing on process, they're focusing on people, they're focusing on customer. And all we want to be able to answer is that if we do those things well, what will be the impact on the financial side? Now, the impact on financial side might be different for different companies. So what this fourth approach might do is actually develop a model in your own company which establishes the relationship between process performance, customer satisfaction, employee satisfaction, and financial performance. So that when you go out there with your annual budgeting exercises and you say, I want X amount of dollars, I mean, you can go back to that particular model and say why I need that and what kind of return it would be. 
where they're always going to face uh, constraints on that. You know, the marketing people wanted to advertise during the Super Bowl, and the finance people wanted for something else, and so on. You know, so you really have to make a solid case why you want to do that. If you have well-established relationship between process improvement, employee satisfaction, and so on, and financial performance, then you can actually justify it. You know. I want to just give you one example, and uh, most of you might have heard about Sears, a uh, big retailing giant in the US. Every major mall would have a Sears store. Okay. And as you would guess, I mean, a store is a big entity, and management needs to manage it. And what they were doing was at the store level, they were collecting a lot of detailed information. What's the employee satisfaction at the store level? What's the customer satisfaction at the store level? And what's the financial performance of the store? I mean, very easy to sort of get this information. And they had this huge database which had historical data by store on these different metrics. And they're probably, they were not doing much about it. Every quarter management would look at it and, you know, sometimes they will slap somebody and say, hey, you guys didn't do well, you need to tighten up. Or they would reward other people based on performance. But there was really no systematic analysis on that. And then there were a bunch of people who were involved in implementing quality management principles. They say, why can we not use this information to actually come up with a formal quantitative model which can establish the relationship between these variables? So the model is very simple. Employee attitude, how good they are, is actually going to improve the employee behavior. And employee behavior is actually going to increase the, influence the service. And service is going to influence the customer impression. That's going to affect customer loyalty and that's going to affect financial performance. So it's a very sort of very simple linkage model. The key thing here is what's the strength of this relationship? You know? I don't have the exact numbers, but they did a lot of econometric analysis. And basically what they could do was they could say, if we improve employee attitude by X percent today, it's going to have, it's going to improve customer retention by Y percent three months down the road. And then six months down the road, my financial performance will increase by Z percent. So they were actually able to quantify this relationship. So now the question becomes, if I want to spend X million dollars trying to improve employee attitude or something like that, I can see what percent it might improve by. I can go and look at my customer satisfaction, and then I can link it back to the financial performance. So here you're kind of making a business case why I should be investing in those activities. Otherwise, you're simply saying, I need to improve my customer attitude, and the marketing people say, well, I need to increase my advertising budget, and there's a question of how do you deal with that. And sometimes the advertising people have more information, because they can see when they run these ads what happens to the sales side, they can make a better case. But if you have this kind of quantitative information, now you can say why investing in these activities actually makes sense. Yeah. So there are four things you could do. Keep track of your self-assessment scores. Keep track of the benefits of the project level, cost of quality system, and building quantitative relationship. Uh, if I had to take a choice right now, I would say the easiest thing would be to sort of keep track at the project level. Look at some of the major quality management projects which you've implemented. Try to keep track of those benefits. I mean, that's kind of the easiest one to do. You know. Assessment scores are going to take some time before you build a long enough history to show that, show that it has an impact. This kind of approach requires a lot of data. And some of you may not have the historical data to do this thing. The cost of quality system is a challenging one, and I think I find that the most useful one, but that's the most difficult one to implement. I mean, accounting data are notorious for not giving you the right information, you know. I mean, all they can tell you in a sense, yeah, you've got this much sales here, the manufacturing cost, and so on. But the moment you want to get into details, it's not that. So that's going to be a little more time consuming in some sense. But, you know, I'm, whichever way you decide, the bottom line is I need to keep track of the benefits. Because at every point, I need to make the business case why I should be doing it. In some sense, when people say, well, you know, we have, we have already labeled it, you know, uh, criteria for business excellence, you know. And, you know, by simply labeling it does not mean that these are excellent criteria. Ultimately, you have to back it with empirical evidence, you know. Okay? And that's kind of the empirical evidence which I've tried to give you here. So, some of your findings. Uh, hopefully, I've convinced you that TKM pays off handsomely. And therefore, what you're going to learn in this course is uh, going to be very valuable, you know, okay? Uh, be realistic. And what I mean by realistic is set the right expectations, you know. And expectations are not set on, are not based on what you necessarily want, you know. I mean, everybody wants the short stock price to go up 100% every year, you know. I mean, that's not going to happen. I mean, expectations are based on reality.
And reality is based on empirical evidence, you know. So in some sense, the empirical evidence which I've given you is the reality or the experience of 600 companies. You may choose to ignore that, that this does not represent the reality. That's your choice. But if you believe in that reality, now I'm giving you a basis for setting expectations, you know. I'm not going to promise too much, saying I'm not going to get everything in six months or a year. It might take three to five years, and here are the kind of benefits which you'll get, you know. Okay? So be realistic about England winning the World Cup. You know, you'll be a happy person. Be patient. And that's a very critical thing is that if you're not patient, this paradigm is not for you. you know? And that's the hardest thing to sell because people want quick returns and huge returns. You know? And that's not going to happen. I mean, I've learned it the hard way. And a lot of my colleagues have learned it the hard way. They're terribly excited about the stock market before the dot-com crash you know, because every day they were making 10%. You know? But now it's back to reality. You know? I mean, it's going to be 8 to 10% a year kind of thing. So we've got to be patient about it. And if you're patient, I, I'm sure it's going to pay off. But let me also add, it's not a guarantee for success. TQM is a management system. It helps you make decisions. It does not mean that you're always going to make the right decision. You know? okay? And a lot of the Baldrige Award winners, are, some of the Baldrige Award winners are doing poorly, not because they have dropped quality management. It's just that they made the wrong decision exposed. You know? I mean, the quality management analysis will say you've got to, you can go this path or that path, you know. And ultimately, it's the managers who have got to make the decision. And some of these companies choose the wrong path, you know. So it's really not a guarantee for success. It improves your ability to make decisions better, and it improves your chances of success. But like anything in this world, it's not a sure bet. The only thing which is sure is you're always going to pay taxes, and one day we'll all pass away, you know. So that's certain. <laughs> uh, don't give up on TQM. Uh, and I mentioned that because I've seen a lot of companies disband their program, or at least not pay the attention. So previously, whereas the vice president of quality would be there in the top management meetings, now they're not invited kind of thing, you know. Or the quality metrics would be the first agenda item, now it's not being even discussed, you know. So in other words, they're still practicing it, but not with the real intensity, you know. Uh, conduct self-assessments, that's kind of a very good way to judge it. You don't want to uh, apply for an award. But just doing an assessment of how well your organization is doing, that itself can be very powerful. Sometimes when I talk to senior executives, they say, yeah, self-assessment is too time consuming, you know. And I say, do you go for an annual medical checkup? You know, I mean, that's still about a day or two in your life every year, you know. And the answer is yes, you know. And why? Because that self-assessment gives you valuable feedback, you know. I mean, in an organization, if it takes a week, two weeks to do that self-assessment, it may certainly be worth it, you know. So that might be a good way of sort of keeping the TQM um, excitement on. A uh, competition, even though you may not be capable of winning it, just competing, applying for an award, you might be surprised how many ideas you get in terms of improvement. And more importantly, you get free feedback. So why not take it, you know? Okay, I mean, experts are going to look at your application depending on the type of award you apply for, particularly for the European Foundation of Quality Management or the BQF award if you apply for. You're getting some good insights into your organization by very experienced people. And it's really not going to cost you that much, you know. So, so why not take advantage of that? It doesn't matter if you score only 200 out of 1,000. And that's good news because there's a room for improvement, you know. So I look at it from that perspective. So anytime you have an opportunity, I mean, it's certainly a good idea to apply, you know. So a final thought, what is uh, TQM? It's not a statistical tool or a technique, you know. OK, fishbone diagram or or uh, design of experiments. Uh, these are what I call as tools and techniques, but quality management is not about that. You know? It's not a program, because whenever you talk about program, it has a definite beginning and a definite ending. You know? To me, quality management is a never-ending journey. You know? I, mean, you, I mean, you just can't give up. It's like so natural if you think about it. You know? okay? Not a replacement for corporate strategy. The fact that you have a good quality management system does not mean everything is fine. I mean, you still have to define your strategy. You know? And you still got to implement the strategy. It's kind of a management system which helps you in that process, you know. But that's not your corporate strategy. I honestly believe that it's a source of competitive advantage. And the reason I believe that is that your product and services can be very quickly replicated by a competition. It doesn't take a whole lot, you know. I mean, you can tear apart a particular product, figure out what's happening. But what your competition cannot replicate are your management systems, you know. Your people how they solve problem, how they share information, how they learn from each other, how they analyze problem. That's something which is very hard to replicate. And it's interesting, um, 
Toyota has a number of plants in US. And you would guess that Toyota should be very secretive about letting GM and Ford people come and visit the plant. And they say, no, guys, come and look at it. You know, We use the same equipment, kind of do the same thing. And you can look at my plant. It's not going to make any difference. Because the real value of what Toyota provides lies in its system, which is very hard to observe, in its people and how they operate. You know? So what quality management gives you this unique advantage, which other people may not be able to copy. You know? okay? And more importantly, think about it that if you're still not convinced, and I hope I've made a very objective and unbiased case. You know, I mean, I don't have an ax to grind here, because if I had found the other results, I would, it would still have been published. You know? so, but I've made an objective case. You know? And if you're, still not, if you're still not convinced about it, just keep in mind, if you don't do it, your competition does it, and they show this kind of improvement, what are your chances of survival? You know? So particularly from that perspective, you need to think about it. You know? Now, having said that, you don't have to necessarily go overboard on quality management. You know? I mean, you have these principles, and you need to decide which applies to your organization and how much it's going to cost you. Because I've seen a lot of time consultants, particularly, they want you to do everything, you know. And a lot of people back out of that. You know, it's too expensive, too time consuming. I mean, it's really the principles which we are talking about, you know. And you need to decide which principles are more important, how much time or how much money you want to invest. It's not necessary that you win the EFTM award. That's good. But, you know, making a start in that direction can certainly create a lot of value, you know. Okay? So that's pretty much um, what I had. And um, we, st oh. we still have about five or ten minutes for That's for a question. Thank you very much. And I know, yeah. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.